Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. It's time for another instalment in the series, Ex Elders Tell All, where I compare notes with fellow former elders. I have two fellow former elders joining me today, Barry from the UK and Kevin from Canada. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, Great Lloyd. to be here. Good to be here, yeah. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we were speaking off camera, and I think between all of us, uh, we're spanning here the years 1992 to 2015, because Barry, you were an elder from approximately 1992 to 1995. Uh, Kevin, you were an elder from approximately 2004 to 2015, and I was an elder for a year from 2008 to 2009. So the idea really is to kind of look back and think about what it was like to be an elder, especially from the perspective of those who never got to see that side of Jehovah's Witness life. So uh, maybe it would be helpful to learn how we became or how specifically you gentlemen became elders because people have heard my story. Um, Barry, how did you get involved with being an elder? Do you want me to start from when I was tiny? and um, or <laughs> An abridged up. version from when you were tiny. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I was a ministerial servant for, for around about 13 years. Um, my father was an elder, um, so I had quite an idea what what being an elder in, entailed uh, as regards my dad um, yeah and being a ministerial servant for 13 years uh, got more and in, more involved in the congregation and, and, and the way it worked and what was required and then yeah around about 1992 um, asked to be, become an elder uh, that went through and I was appointed to to the body of older men as they were called then and mm. made me feel quite old at the time. I didn't feel <laughs> old, but... <laughs> you say you, you were asked to be appointed. I didn't know it worked that way. So well, you were you were reaching out, I think, is probably what, what we would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I was approached by a brother, basically. Yeah. He, he was then the presiding overseer. I don't know what they call them today, whether they still have a presiding overseer. They may do. Um. But yeah, he was basically he basically said that uh, I was reaching out. Um, what do you think about uh, reaching out to, for the position of elder? We think that you know you qualify for that, uh, and it went from there really. Um, yeah, I mean, it was yeah. You, you, I think if you're reaching out, you 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 become an elder. If, uh, not automatically, that's the wrong word. But if you if you do your minimum of 10 hours a month or whatever it is and you and I had a family that I was bringing up as well so I had two daughters and they were attending meetings we were attending meetings regularly going out in field service regularly I had one or two bible studies at the time so I suppose it just type of slowly went into becoming an elder and I'd been brought up a witness so I knew the organization inside out from a congregational aspect um, so, yeah, uh, I think it was just a natural progression, to be honest, Lloyd. And Kevin, how did you get roped mm. into uh, the privilege? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I definitely didn't feel roped in at the time. Um, I was 28. I was newly married for about three years. I had just spent four years in Bethel in Canada at the headquarters. And now I was pioneering with my wife at the time. I'm now separated and on the, in the process of getting divorced. But um, yeah, we were busy doing Jehovah's Witness stuff. You know, we're, we're preaching a lot. We're all our friends are witnesses. We're busy in the truth. We're involved in RBC projects, those building projects. Um, and it just felt like a natural progression in my spiritual journey to be offered this opportunity, this privilege of service to be an elder. So it was actually a beautiful moment when two really good friends of mine that were kind of mentors to me in the congregation, other elders sat me down and said that they would like to, um, that I've been appointed, you know, barring, you know, me not qualifying. Mm. So, and I was 28 years old or so. I think um, there's a lot of 
um, to some degree, justifiable anger towards not just mm. elders, but by extension, anyone who's been involved as an elder, because, you know, let's face it, elders uh, are tasked with doing some pretty atrocious things. Mm. And I think this series is helpful, or at least I hope one of the ways that this series is helpful is in helping those who do carry this anger to understand that, you know, becoming an elder isn't necessarily about wanting control, you know, wanting mm -hmm. power. Um, I, I don't know what you guys think, but certainly in my case, it felt like there was an expectation so that, you know, if you are a male in the congregation and you don't have terrible social skills, if you are able to form coherent sentences <laughs> and you, uh, you know, you get on with people and you are doing uh, what's expected of you in terms of the preaching work, you know, there would be questions asked if you weren't interested in becoming certainly mm -hmm. a ministerial servant and by extension an elder. I don't know what you gentlemen, how you gentlemen feel about it. I think you, you're correcting what you say. I think there's an expectation there, particularly if you're brought up as a witness. Um, there is an expect, expectation that, that you you progress in, in, into being a ministerial servant or an elder. My motivation was, I think, was, was to help people um, because I thought that was the right thing to do, being brought up as a witness. Um, that was my motivation. One of the things I found, and I don't know if, if it's the right thing to say at this point, but when I, when, I, when I was a type of appointed to the body, I knew there was a few problems within the body, but I was surprised at how much disrespect there was in that body of elders when I was appointed. Mm. In fact, it, it became a shock to me because of I was a bit naive, perhaps, being brought up as a witness. I had this rosy coloured expectation of, of what an elder should be and when I was appointed to this particular body of elders in in my congregation it was it was an eye-opener for me um, but I think you're right Lord Lloyd I think there's an expectation there uh, particularly if you're a male serving in in, in the congregation of, of Jehovah's Witnesses but my main motivation was was, was to help people at mm. that particular time and how about you Kevin I agree. There is an expectation, also a desire. Like I, I never felt squeezed into someone else's mold. I uh, being raised in, you know, the machine in the Borg, I was conditioned to want to reach out for that. And I would be lying if I said it was pure service, you know, because I, it, it also comes with some prestige and you get to be on stage a little more and you have more power, quote unquote. But um, fundamentally, I, tr I, I truly did want to support and care for and help uh, the, the people in my congregation and the people in my circuit and eventually the people in my district. So, mm. yeah, my, my motives were mostly pure, a little bit selfish, a little bit proud, for sure. Mm. Yeah. And you, you've alluded there, Barry, to it being an eye-opener. I, I can very much relate to that. Anyone who's read my book will know that, you know, my experience of being an elder was one of, you know, intense politics and infighting and mm. seeing firsthand um, the position of elder and specifically the position of coordinator or presiding overseer being wielded um, to... Uh, exact vengeance on people and mm. so I'm, I'm interested to know more about you know again this element of life as an elder that jehovah's witnesses simply don't see which is a very human element mm -hmm. i think it's a very closed door when you're an elder because we've got our own uh, or we did have and i think they still have the, the elders book as we used to call it that the, the rank and file are not meant to see or know about and that straight away makes it a bit of a I don't know, like a different level, you know, because I often said, well, why can't we share this information? Well, you know, you know, you're not meant to do that. It's for the elders eyes only. But yeah, I mean, one of the comments I made because of the infighting that, that was going on in the congregation, which you couldn't keep completely out of um, 
the organization's site, if you like, because we, we picked we were picking up on things, you know, even though we weren't elders, certainly the ministerial servants were. And when I became an elder, it, it was very evident that there was a some type of power struggle going on. And, and it just opened my eyes completely because I remember making the comment that um, if I was sat on a board as, as a board member uh, as a company, you know, I, I wouldn't be talking to them in the same disrespectful manner. And that's, you know, I, I just couldn't get my head around that, Lloyd. It, mm. it was it was it was an eye opener. And and that, I think, affected me and probably led to one of the reasons why, why I eventually left the organization because of because of that. It wasn't the reason, but it was one of, of many reasons, you know. Kevin. Is the question, you know, did I observe infighting and mm -hmm. was there an eye opening? Um, near the beginning, there was a little bit of positioning and uh, political maneuvering that would happen before our elders meetings, kind of behind the scenes, like the secretary would call his buddy who was the presiding overseer and they would kind of say, you know, we really want to see this happen. Um, but the guy that I was closest to on the body that was kind of like my mentor, he always hated that. And he was deep, like I consider him a deeply spiritual person. And uh, he always pointed out to me that that's not cool. And that that is that doesn't leave room for Holy Spirit when you're coming to the meeting with an agenda like you're supposed to be, you know, coming to the meeting with this prayerful demeanor and this openness to the Holy Spirit. Um, so I saw a contrast there. And I mean, I certainly served on judicial committees where I saw some very strong emotion and even fighting between members during the deliberation process. But that was rare. That honestly was very rare for me, my experience. Mm. I, I, interesting, you mentioned about, you know, the openness to the Holy Spirit. I can remember mm. um, uh, this particular individual who, who again, you know, was using his position to get his own way, basically. I can remember yeah. him saying things like, I was in this situation speaking to this brother about this issue, and the Holy Spirit moved me to ask about this. Oh, wow. And it was almost as though he knew that, <laughs> that what he was saying to this guy was inappropriate. <laughs> and not the right question to be asking. But yeah. he covered over the whole thing by saying, yeah, but, you know, yeah. uh, the Holy Spirit moved me to do it. Um, and I guess nice. when you consider the fact that elders are supposed to be appointed by the Holy Spirit, you can yeah. kind of understand how he could make that leap in his mind that he, that the Holy Spirit mm. is on, a, on an almost day-to-day -day basis guiding the way he carries out his duties well i always yeah, remember my father saying to me that uh, because obviously he was an elder for, for many many years and just before i was appointed he said don't forget that uh, we're, we're we're human and i thought and he never said anything more than that that's all he said to me mm. and it's only when i became an elder that i think i realized what he meant i mean dad passed away a few years ago now so um, and he probably wouldn't recognize it like I don't in many ways re recognize the organized organization as it is today. Um, mm. But I just thought it was a strange thing that he should mention that or say that to me. Um, mm. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in as a as mm. just as a comment, really. Interesting. Yeah. So we also mentioned or you mentioned, I think, uh, Kevin, about uh, judicial committees and you know, the fact that these would be perhaps a source of, of contention mm -hmm. uh, when it came to deliberating. I very, I'm very grateful for the fact that in the 12 months that I was an elder, fortunately, I never got asked once to deliberate on a judicial committee. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing the same can't be said for you gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to ask, um, to what extent were you involved in that? And do you feel any regret over your involvement in, in judicial committees? Um, I, I don't know the number. I never did the math, but I was probably on about 30. Wow. Judicial, okay. probably maybe a bit more, maybe mm -hmm. a bit less, something like that. Uh, do I regret? That's a great question. 
I mean, now looking back, now that I'm a full blown apostate and I said, I believe that it's all just a make believe man made, uh, mm. you know, nonsense. I, I miss the years that I spent in the machine and I'm sad that I was so convinced that it was real that I, I spoke with such a deep level of conviction. I probably helped other people cement their, you know, their mm. own uh, faith in the organization. Mm. Uh, so I do regret that. In fact, while I was disfellowshipped, I helped. The only time I ever helped somebody become a witness is while I was disfellowshipped. And I regret that the most. Um, and I've done what I can to make amends to that person. But Were you ever involved in uh, disfellowshipping somebody and felt strongly that they shouldn't be disfellowshipped and they were disfellowshipped? Mm. No, I never, I never um, was part of a disfellowshipping decision where I thought that the person was being treated unfairly and that they should not be. Mm. No, not my experience, no. I, I think that one of the reasons I asked that is, you know, this, these are decisions that in, impact people enormously. You know, yeah. ostrac ostracism is something that, uh, can mm -hmm. seriously damage people, you know, to the point of leading them to suicide. And mm -hmm. the way it works with uh, decisions reached by judicial committees is that they have to be uh, in agreement. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, well, we're, we're split 50-50. There are three on the committee and they all have to reach a consensus. So if there's one who is against the way it's going, according to the other two, they have to bring their decision into line with the other two. So I can foresee, especially over the course of 30 judicial committees, I can mm -hmm. see it being the case that, you, that you're the odd one out, and yet you still have to vote according to the way the other two uh, are voting. But you're saying that in all of those situations, you were all in agreement. Well, I just don't remember being the one that thought the person should not be, and they were. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not saying we were always in agreement, but I never mm -hmm. felt like I, I was like had my arm twisted to kick somebody out. I mean, now, of course, in retrospect, I think shunning and disfellowshipping is a horrific, mm -hmm. damaging practice. But at the time, um, yeah, I didn't feel any uh, any qualms about any of those particular cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how even with like thinking, you know, taking away the whole elder thing and the whole judicial committee thing, mm -hmm. just thinking about the way my mind was working as a Jehovah's Witness, shunning was never a huge thing for me. Mm -hmm. Possibly because I hadn't had to do too much of it in my own family. Mm -hmm. um, I was only ever aware of sort of friends of friends who were disfellowshipped, maybe mm -hmm. one or two kind of distant relatives um, but there was no it wasn't impacting me on a personal level and, and therefore I was able to say you know what you know there are scriptures backing this up the faithful mm -hmm. slave is recommending this this course you know we should just go along with it and we should support it so you know mm -hmm. that thinking very much in, uh, influenced the way I went about my duties as, as an elder. I'm just glad that I never had to actually mm. do the deed because mm. if I had been involved in a, someone being disfellowshipped, I guess I would be thinking, oh gosh, did they end up really struggling emotionally and psychologically due to me being a part of that process, you know? Mm -hmm. Barry, do you mind if I speak to that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, Lloyd, it's funny because I had the opposite experience because mm. when I was like 22, 21, my brother was disfellowshipped. So when I was in Bethel, my brother, he actually just come to Bethel as my guest and slept overnight a few weeks before then. Right. And then, and he was the closest friend I had in the world and he was disfellowshipped and I cut him off. And um, instead of making me go, wait a minute, this is messed up. And how could this be loving? And this is not healthy. None of that crossed my mind mm. when I was indoctrinated. You know, <laughs> I thought I thought all the things I was taught to think. I thought this is good. This is an intervention. This is loving. It's going to help him like snap, snap out of it and come to his spent his senses and like get back on track and reconnect with God and, re and he'll get all of us back. 
And I, and so my entire, like even time as an elder, I was shunning my brother and I had this like righteous indignation for wickedness. And I believe shunning, it was even more loving because of the experience I had with my brother. So it's interesting how mm. we respond differently to different um, we do. conditioning. We're, we're all different and our brain chemistry is different and uh, our experience mm. is certainly different. So Barry, will you, uh, you know, how do you look back on, on your involvement with judicial committees if you were involved? I was only ever involved in one judicial uh, committee. Um, I suppose looking back at it now, um, that person was disfellowshipped. Um, hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? And I mm. think Kevin's the nail on the head. When you're indoctrinated and you're in that zone, you look at things in a completely different perspective. If I'm honest with myself, I can't say that I was totally, um, it didn't sit right with me, the decision, but being a new elder at the time, I hadn't been an elder for very many months. I, I, I guess looking back, I was type of led by the two more experienced elders and it was only the one ju judicial committee that I ever sat on and I'm, I'm grateful that I didn't sit on any more now in, in retrospect, but looking back now um some many years later um and i don't know whatever happened to that person now um it obviously had a big effect on that person's life but yeah it doesn't sit well with me now where i am if mm. i'm totally honest and it's something that i've got got to live as live with as a, as a person and just realize that i was that person then and like many years later i am the person i am now so that person that existed back then is somewhat different to the person that exists now um mm. it's not you know looking back it's not something that that i was particularly proud of at the time but i thought i was doing the right thing yeah and that's, and that's the problem i guess yeah we we were convinced that we had power that we you know in in all reality we just simply didn't have uh it was all just this kind of bizarre I won't call it a game because it had very real co consequences in people's lives, but you know, we, it, it's all construction, just a charade. A construction. Yeah, mm -hmm. It was. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm interested to know as well what your perception was in terms of, you know, the power and, and the awe with which other members mm -hmm. of the congregation would look upon elders, because, you know, I think this is relevant as well in the context of, uh, the handling, the mishandling of child abuse, because if you're looking at this from an outsider's perspective, you're going to say, "Well, if a child's being abused, the parents need to sort this out." Uh, you're not going to be able to understand how it could be that parents would think of elders as mm -hmm. the first port of call over the police. It's only when you spend time as a witness that you understand how much influence and power elders have to the point where, you know, if anything of that nature happens, it's immediately the elders need to know about this, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. And, and I grew up um, viewing the elders as, um, you don't realise it at the time, but as these super beings in a way of, of keepers of the faith. Um, and you do grow up with that reference, reverence to, to, to the elders. I think it, it, it borders on the similar deference that, that, and I think you hit it on Lloyd with, with child abuse, with the way that the British generally look at religion in a, you know, they, they top the hat or doff the hat to, to religion. They can't think it's possible that this religion would, would, would go down that road or, or they would commit things like child abuse. So, I think we look at, or I did, when growing up as the elders, as, as these, you know, uh, spiritual policemen for want for want of a better word, um, and that's and that, that's that's how we viewed them. You know, if you had a problem, you'd go to the elders. Uh, if the elders would come around counselling you, I mean, I remember being counselled by the by the elders because my hair was down to my collar and you know and things like that. And so you go and get your hair cut. You know, that's that's the control that the elders had over you. Uh, and it was control. If you look back now, 
you know, if a brother came around and counselled you because, um, you know, you, you, you wore a short dress if you were a, a sister or if my hair was too long or if my beard was too long or if I even had, had a beard, I, I'd get an elder come around and cut and so I'd have to shave it off or it was all right to have a beard when I when I played King David, though, in one of the costume dramas <laughs> and I grew a beard for that. I thought that was a bit hypocritical that's going back when you had the costume drawing the drama so I mm. I don't know whether we've all got beards now so whether that's a little bit of a um <laughs> a thing about just things. easier for me it's just easier yeah, there's just exactly. no reason at all to shave it off yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think yeah I grew up and I think it's probably the same for Kevin if he's been mm. brought up is that we had this deference towards the elders and I think you're right Lloyd it is a power I mean when we're an elder we don't I didn't recognize it as a power, but it, my standing in the congregation when I was appointed the elder, certainly from a ministerial servant, I could see that step change how the others, um, the publishers in, in the organization, sorry, in the congregation actually looked at me and the way mm. that they interacted with me as well. Mm. Were you uh, aware of, of being treated differently when you became an elder, Kevin? I think so. I think so. There's also this other layer of um, the people that outside Jehovah's Witness world may not intuitively understand. And that is that no congregation is an island. Like they're connected to other bunches of congregations and to circuits. And then they have these, you know, biannual big thousand people, 2000 people meetings as a circuit. And then there's like the summer convention with like a whole bunch of those. So especially if an elder also was given teaching opportunities at those larger meetings. I feel like in that person's congregation, that elder even had more influence and more sway and more like respect. And, and, you know, there's more deference. I don't know about the word awe, but maybe even awe, you know, maybe inspiration from that particular kind of elder that teaches a lot. Um, and I, I, ended up with a few of those privileges. And I, I do feel like the more I did that stuff, the more I was on stage at the bigger assemblies and conventions, that the more there almost became a little bit of like a special power or influence that I cre I developed because of that. Yeah, it doesn't make, it's dumb. It doesn't, like it shouldn't happen that way, but it's just, you know, it's a thing that happens. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's human nature, isn't it? When, mm -hmm. when we're given more attention, yeah. it does... Uh, influence our, our perception of ourselves and yeah. you can only imagine what's going on in the minds of the governing body with how much attention yeah. gets lavished on them yeah um i wonder if we could uh now turn to the issue of uh of child abuse mishandling um is that something that either of you have any uh, experience or knowledge of in your when you were elders i must admit no uh, and I'm grateful for that in many ways, obviously. Um, I never came across it, or I wasn't aware of it as being an elder, and certainly growing up as a witness, I didn't come across it. Having said that, the, I noticed when not long after I left the congregation, there was uh, a demonstration outside the Kingdom Hall with people with placards saying about child abuse. And I was surprised to a certain extent because um, I wasn't aware of it certainly growing up as uh, as a witness uh, and as an elder and I think because of the work you've done Lloyd I think you've uncovered how it was swept under the carpet and it was kept hidden from even from the elders uh, in many cases um, mm. but no thankfully I, I didn't come across it uh, when I was an elder or, or ministerial mm. servant. Kevin? Same. Yeah, never, ne never had an incident involving child abuse and never was even aware of one. Mm. Um, the only like really far, what's the like, the only thing I ever heard ever of a child abuse situation was a 16 year old in a neighboring congregation that had had um, a sexual experience with an 18 year old um, individual. But that was the the only time anything even possibly broaching child abuse was uh, was raised. It, when I think back, 
I because I can remember the letter being read out. I don't know whether you remember this, Barry. Actually, you would have left by this point. Um, so. when they yeah when they had the panorama documentary in 2002 in america it was uh, they did a dateline documentary in in the uk it was the bbc panorama and there was a letter read out at the kingdom halls uh effectively trying to put their own spin on things and basically prepare the congregation for the fact that this huge exposure was coming and it was really the first time back then in 2002 when there was any real exposure of this but i can remember you know uh, being there when this letter was read out thinking how could we possibly have a problem with that and i even watched the panorama documentary feeling myself kind of momentarily uneasy and swayed somewhat by what by by what i was watching but almost immediately the co the cognitive dissonance kicked in and i was finding reasons to dismiss the material I was being shown. Uh, and I think when I look back to my experience as a Jehovah's Witness and the fact that I didn't encounter uh, abuse, well, in a way, that's the whole problem, isn't it? When you're covering up abuse, when you're sweeping it under the rug so that only, so that the branch is in control of everything and they are the gatekeepers of information. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> it's going to be easy for people mm -hmm. to even reach the the position of elder. And because they don't happen to be on a certain judicial committee, um, they're, they're just not aware of it. Um, but one element of the provisions, the current policy, involves if someone is reproved for being um, for, for child abuse, and restrictions are added so that elders are expected to essentially police that individual for the rest of their lives and make sure they don't come into contact with children and make sure they don't work with any children in the preaching work. As former elders, I have to ask you, how practical do you think it would be for, el for a body of elders to stop an individual from coming into contact with children through their worship as a Jehovah's Witness for the rest of their lives? It just wouldn't work, Lloyd. Not from my experience. Um, I, In the past, when I was an elder and a ministerial servant, uh, and, and a, before that, when a brother of good standing in the organisation, if you like, we were very often asked to take little Johnny or Mary out in field service um, particularly if it was uh, a, a sister who, who was bringing up somebody as a witness, didn't have a husband that was in the truth, so and even have a Bible study with them in some cases. So I think the practicality of that is it just wouldn't work, not in the way that, that I was aware at, at my time in the organisation, and I don't think it's changed much since 1995. It may have done... But yeah, I just can't see how they could even police that and not, it, it would just be awkward, particularly for if, if it was a brother or sister who was accused of, of, of being a, a child molester or a sexual abuser. I just don't know how, how they could police it to, to that degree. It, it's just impossible. Kevin? Yeah, same. It's, imp <laughs> it's impossible. There's so many meetings and so many field service groups that the elders are not at. And unless the elders were to divulge, you know, the identity of this perpetrator that was convicted and guilty to the ministerial servants who are running the midweek service arrangements, then which they would never do, you know, that would be impossible. And even being in the kingdom hall, you could be five feet from a kid, mm. you know, and you could be a convicted pedophile. So, I mm. mean, or I accused of pedophilia, I should say, yeah. and, and rightfully so. Um, so yeah, and there's just so much exposure. There's no way to isolate. The only the only solution would be if you sat the pedophile down and said, you're not allowed to go to the Kingdom Hall and you're not allowed to go in service with anybody under the age of 18. And we hope and pray that you will follow our directions. Well, you know? even even then, because one thing that they say is, um, oh, well, for example, they wouldn't be uh, doing door-to-door -door preaching unless they were working with an elder. 
um, or someone who was aware of of their threat to to the public. But here's the thing: even if they were calling at someone's door with an elder who knew all about them and knew what a threat they posed to the public, you know, this kid opens the door. And we've totally. all been there. We've all been yeah. there. Um, and even you know, what's to stop? that person calling again by themselves, having ingratiated themselves with the family and come across as this, this lovely person, as far as I know, it's just, it's just a really polite Jehovah's Witness. What's to stop them calling back by themselves if they're, if they're an absolutely determined sexual predator, you know? And, and many of them, as we know, are incredibly calculated that way. Um, I, think so, too, Lloyd, I, think, I think too, Lloyd, as well, the two witness rule just about plays into to the hands of, of people who are that way inclined. Because how mm. the heck can you have they work the way that it works? I presume is that, that there's, there isn't a second witness. Why, why, why would there be? And, and it just makes it that, that much easier for, 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 for a person to, to, to practice whatever he, he practices in that way. So mm. the witnesses just don't help themselves, do they, with, with, with their own interpretation of, 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 of the, how they interpret the Bible. Um, it's, just, it's just a crazy situation, the two-witness rule, I think. It will. It beggars belief, hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Indeed. Um, I think it would be helpful. Uh, I'm sort of aiming to kind of draw this to, to some form of conclusion, but it would be helpful if you could... Um, direct some comments to those watching who might be elders themselves, because I'm mindful of the fact that there are a lot of quote unquote PIMO elders out there physically mm -hmm. in mentally out. In fact, mm -hmm. I've, I listen to voicemails. Some, some of them I can't broadcast. I've answered one or two of them on the channel. It's, ast it's astonishing that I'm mm -hmm. basically in contact sometimes publicly on the channel with people who are now acting as elders um, what would be your advice to quote unquote PMO elders who feel as though there just isn't a way out and they just need mm. to continue kind of as part of the system, even if it means um, attending judicial committees and arranging for people to be shunned? That's a tough one, Lloyd, because everybody's different. Um, I can only relate to my personal experience. I think I was a PMO for, for quite some time, even when, when I became an elder. I had doubts then. But and you say, well, why did you become an elder? Because because you the way it works in a cult is that you become indoctrinate, indoctrinated as a witness and you just do what is expected of you. With me, I made a decision. And it was a big decision in the end. I just couldn't live with, with what was going on inside my uh, conscience, if you like. My belief systems were being challenged. I challenged and did research and I couldn't believe um, what, what I was finding out about the witnesses and about the religion I'd been brought up with and thought was the truth. That's what we used to call it. Still do, I think, witnesses, the truth for you know, how long I was in the truth from two years of age. It's a big decision to make. And it's like jumping off a cliff because if you've been brought up in the truth and if you're an elder, you've probably spent many years as a witness, you'll invariably drop out the truth with, and certainly I did, with no friends, no family and very little backup. Because when I did that in 1995, there was very little on the way of the internet to help. And I think this is where it's, I don't know if it's the right word, easier to come out because of what's on the internet with the work that you've done in the last 10 years, Lloyd. It must have been a great help. And it certainly helped me to come to terms even now after all these years with some of the the skeletons in the closet of being, of being a witness. Um, yeah, I think you have to have an exit plan. I, and that's something I didn't have at the time, looking back. Um, I should have planned it a little bit more, but it was either getting out or going completely loopy, and I decided to take the plunge. So I jumped off out of an aeroplane without a parachute, basically. But I think now, if the only advice I can give is, is if you've got doubts and you want out, is to, is to formulate some type of exit plan. And you've got many videos 
that you've done, Roy, to help people do that. And, and that's, a, you know, it's got to be a good thing. So that's my advice. Look at the videos that Lloyd's done. There's other people who are ex-witnesses on, on there as well. I'm sure that will help, but try and formulate an exit strategy and then follow it. Thank you, Barry. The check's in the post for all those plugs for the channel. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Kevin, what would be your advice to any PMO elders who might be watching? Yeah, I want you guys to ask yourself one question. And it's a question that I've, I've discovered is one of the most important questions I've ever asked myself. Um, and that I've actually asked an elder this past year who reached out to me. And the question is, what would have to happen for you to stop believing what you currently believe? What would have to happen for you to stop believing what you currently believe? And if you say, well, nothing, like nothing, I would never abandon my faith in the organization. Well, then that's, that's a problem because then you're brainwashed and you're just like a victim of all of this conditioning, which, you know, most elders would not say. So it forces you to go, okay, well, if it's, what would it take actually for me to start questioning some of these things that I've believed were certain my entire life? And then the second thing I invite you to do, if you're watching this as an elder, is to go on Amazon and read the reviews of Crisis of Conscience. And I say the reviews because when I first heard about that book, I was so terrified I would not even touch the book because I had been you know, raised to believe that Ray Franz was this horrific you know, apostate evil person. And I just wanted to read the reviews. I think there's like hundreds of reviews on Amazon. And I read them all and I, all the reviews and I was like, oh, this guy is not angry and he's not hateful and he's not bitter and he's not, you know, like seething with resentment. He's just, he's just kind of sad and disappointed that what he thought was real isn't. And that's what cracked open the possibility in my mind of considering um, ordering the book. And I did. And that, and that book pulverized my world in a, in a space of about five days last year and open my eyes to to the reality that this is all a construction. Um, who who knew the Jehovah's Witness religion better, Kevin the Elder or Kevin today? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, Kevin today. Ironic, um, isn't it? Barry, it would is. you say that? Yes, in a nutshell. Um, yeah. I think once you're in, when you're in it, you don't really know it until you're out mm. of it. I know that sounds mm. weird, but yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, you're kind and of. I feel embarrassed. I, of, I, I partly feel a bit embarrassed about being part of of what I now recognise as being a cult. Yeah. I think. I think. I, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but if I'm being completely honest, I think a lot of being an elder is sort of blagging it, and and sort of. <laughs> You know, I don't know what this it, word means. What does that mean? It, it, like it. It's put basic, basically putting up a pretense. Oh, it's um, like faking it, faking it, kind of a little bit. Yeah, you know, you, you are doing a job that you are obviously, obviously, always going to be underqualified for because you are basically mm -hmm. policing people's personal lives in very personal areas, mm. and you are a shepherd to the congregation you are a font of wisdom you are someone that people turn to and in my case i was 28 i didn't know anything mm -hmm. at 28 you know <laughs> um you know what? You know what? And, and here i was pretending to know more or at least as much as people in their 40s 50s 60s 70s come on and that's what i couldn't understand when, when i when i was growing up i always thought an elder and i was told that an elder had to be at least in his mid 30s to 40s and the reason for that was and you hit the nail on the head life experience mm. i mean due respect to you when you said you were an elder at 28 and kevin what when was you appointed an elder same same 28 mm. yeah I'm not being funny, but how the hell can you have life experience at 28? And you're, you're, you could be speaking to somebody who's 60 years old 
28. I was still figuring things out at 28, quite honestly. And there I was mm. pretending to know enough to run people's lives for them, which is essentially what being an elder is about. So well, the very term elder, I wouldn't I wouldn't class somebody being 28, somebody being an elder. Yeah. It's like a misnomer, isn't it? I mean, yeah. but that's that's the way it was. So, you know, mm. it's all. Wow. I think we've we've learned a lot from our conversation and I'm sure it will provoke many, many comments. But uh, gentlemen, I really appreciate you setting aside time to share your experiences. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I know I certainly have. Don't forget, you can watch more such videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.